All right, I'm Andrew Easton with the ESUCC, and I'm joined today by Michaela Laborde of ESU3 and Ellen Stokebrand of ESU4, uh, and really grateful to both of them uh, as they're joining us to share some of their insights on uh, this topic, resources for special education and other priority populations. This is part two. Uh, we recorded another video that delves into this uh, on another page, so make sure that you check that out. Uh, if you have additional questions, but uh, our focus for this particular video is going to be uh, to look at this question of have you examined appropriate service delivery models for each discipline? Big question for five minutes. So we're just going to uh, really just scratch the surface, but hopefully point um, administrators in the right direction of what they should uh, yeah, be looking looking to for answers in this space. And so we'll actually start with Michaela. Uh, Michaela, what would you say to administrators that are looking uh, to address that that need for their district? Well, I would say that right now everyone is doing the best that they can to try to make individualized decisions. And really, that's not that different from what we want to do all of the time. And so when we're looking to serve different special populations who might have uh, students with disabilities, students that might have um, English as a second language needs. I mean, there's all sorts of special accommodations that we look to make in a typical school environment. And, and what we want to challenge administrators to do right now is just to take that same individualization and apply that to a different setting or apply it to remote learning. So I think um, some of the lessons we, we consistently want to remind administrators about is, um, you know, we don't do that here is probably not something we want to say. We want to try to work hard to find a way to make it to make it work or to make that accommodation. Um, you know, we always do this or we never do that. I mean, that's, again, something we try to stay away from even when we're in typical uh, situations. So during this really unique uh, challenge that we're facing with the pandemic, it's, it's, it's even more important than, than usual to, to make accommodations and to try to be individualized. But um, teachers are incredibly creative and incredibly resilient. And so I think they are finding a lot of different ways to serve kids uh, with a variety of needs, to get creative, um, to be in person, to be hybrid, to be, you know, remote only. I think they're, they're doing everything that they can. So um, so that would be kind of the first message, the first and, and most important message is just try to be individualized. And, and that one size fits all thing just doesn't typically work for our kids and our programs. Yeah. And you kind of touched upon the other topics we I think we're going to get to there with this one. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't add at this point that there is a teacher facing page that this um, initiative has put together that does have tech tools and strategies that I think would allow some teachers who might be a little fixed in their thinking or in terms of what they're able to provide in the classroom. That would, would um, help to stretch their toolkit in terms of the, the different types of accommodations they might be able to make. Uh, Ellen, in listening into that, what would you say to kind of further um, our administrators thinking on this topic? Well, one thing first, I always talk about good teaching is good teaching, no matter whether you're virtual or whether you're face to face in the classroom. The other thing is when you think about making those jumps back and forth between virtual and face to face, what works well face to face can also work well virtually. It's just you might have to frame it a little bit differently or or um, or pre teach some of those things or or figure out how you're going to work with that student in that in that environment. So anything that we can do now when we're face to face with with the student and teaching them how to do those those same routines when we're virtual is, is actually going to help us out a lot. And so a lot of what we're already doing and a lot of collaborating with the classroom teachers we're working with, those are the things I think that are going to be most important. Yeah, and I, I hear in what you're sharing there that we're talking about kind of setting those expectations, a mindset really, for uh, that this isn't necessarily any different in terms of what you can, uh, should look to provide or the answers that you should give to um, right to students and parents or as uh, they participate in this. And so um, having sort of addressed our three questions here, I think kind of all at once, um, what are some resources you might point uh, administrators to, to kind of help further their thinking on this topic? Well, yep, Michaela. Yeah, let's start. Um, you know, one of the resources that's included um, on the page is CASEL. And CASEL, of course, 
is uh, an amazing resource for the area of mental health and social emotional learning. And so um, they have a great page with COVID resources because right now we've got kids, we've got staff who are experiencing a lot of stress or anxiety uh, for a variety of reasons. And so um, there's some fantastic resources there. You know, as an administrator, um, one of the things I know you're responsible for, and it can often be a heavy burden, is the well-being and the and the mental, you know, health of your staff. I think there's a lot of pressure on administrators to try to keep our teachers moving forward because we know the burden is so great on them. So one of the things that Castle has put together is a really cool um like wellness survey that teachers can take. Um, I just worked with a group of teachers the other day and it's it's COVID specific. So it has a lot of mindfulness kinds of activities. Uh, it's an inventory really that helps them think about their own wellness. And um, it has a lot of really specific suggestions to try to take care of yourself for self care. So that is on that page. And I know that's an amazing resource. So as an administrator, if you're looking for something to do with your staff, um, whether, um, you know, just to try to take care of their wellness and to help them with self-care, there's some specific strategies. But but uh, Castle's filled with a ton of resources for students and staff. Yeah, absolutely. And we've uh, housed that and some other resources um, on our on our website, both here on the admin facing page and also on our teacher facing page. Uh, Ellen, what uh, is a site or so that you might uh, recommend at this time as well? Well, Kayla took the, Michaela took the big one, but um, I would also talk about the, the IRIS site at the University of Vanderbilt. That site is um, it actually uh, spends a little bit more time on the academics than some of those things, the high leverage practices that we use day to day with our students. It's just a reminder of those are the same practices we want to use no matter what environment we're learning in. It's uh, again, I go back to good teaching is good teaching. And so, you know, once we've um, uh, taking care of our social emotional needs. We also need to take care of those academic needs and make sure that we're providing that foundation because we're going to keep on moving forward with all of those things as well. So uh, high leverage practices off of that website. That's a piece that I think people really want to go after. It talks about explicit instruction. It talks about um, collaboration with parents, collaboration with other teachers, co-teaching. talks about all of those instructional models. Terrific. And I, I think those two, along with uh, obviously the NDE uh, special education page uh, would be another resource. And so um, really, Michaela, Ellen, thank you so much for your time in sharing on this topic uh, as we try to support our administrators statewide um, with this very important work. Thank you. Thanks.